Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Old Cambridge Baptist Church for what will be a really historic and necessary conversation in this country uh, about what it means to not only provide sanctuary, but to be sanctuary at a time like this during the Trump era in which we're facing historic number of deportations. Um, and just to contextualize this further, a newspaper a couple of weeks ago, one of the conservative newspapers reported, quote, President Trump's push to deport bad hombres is working, according to a new report from immigration authorities, revealing that 41,318 illegals were arrested in the administration's first 100 days. Uh, according to the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, those, those arrests reflect an increase of 34.6% over the same period in 2016. Nearly 75% of those arrested for deportation were criminals. It is not an accident, the words that are being used in this report from the Washington Examiner that was distributed pretty widely. It's not an accident that when, the, when, the, when human beings were referred to as illegals and the term criminal was never in, is never defined. I'm Jose Antonio Vargas. I'm the founder and the CEO of Define American. And our job at Define American is to humanize this most political partisan of issue in which we have a culture in this country in which being anti-immigrant is not only acceptable, being anti-immigrant actually gets you to the White House. So how do we, as citizens of this country, documented or undocumented, provide sanctuary to people who need it? Right? So this is the conversation. And joining me in this conversation are the following panelists. And when I call your name, please join us in the stage. The Reverend Dr. Cody Sanders, the pastor of the Old Cambridge Baptist Church and uh, the American Baptist Chaplain at Harvard University. Here at OCBC, Cody engages in a shared ministry with the staff and congregation, providing ministerial leadership in the areas of preaching and worship, pastoral care, Christian education and social justice enablement, enablement organizational development, and community outreach. In his capacity as American Baptist chaplain at to Harvard University, Cody works alongside 30 plus multi-faith and secular chaplains to cultivate the religious, spiritual, and ethical life of the university, and serves the spiritual needs of American Baptist students on campus. And thank you for hosting us. Uh, please join us, the Reverend Kathleen O'Keefe Reed. The Reverend uh, Reed has served as pastor of University Lutheran Church since March 2013. A uh, Chicago area native, Pastor Reed studied at Boston University's College of Communications and has a uh, Master's of Divinity from the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Gettysburg. Her ministerial experience includes parish ministry in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Eight years as an assistant to the Bishop of the New England Synod. Am I pronouncing that right? C. Seen it. Thank you. And five years directing development at the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Gettysburg. I would love to welcome Gabriela Chavez. Gabriela Chavez was born and raised in Southern California and is the proud daughter of Salvadoran and Bolivian immigrants. She graduated with her Bachelor's of Arts in Religious Studies from Wesleyan University in 2013. During her time at Harvard, she focused on working with the immigrant community, doing work with Centro Presente, Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinic, Kids, Kids in Need of Defense, and the Cambridge Interfaith Sanctuary Coalition. She hopes to continue this work after her recent graduation from Harvard Divinity School with her Master's of Divinity. And lastly, Nestor Pimienta, who is a recent graduate of Harvard Divinity School. While at the school, he was part in founding two organizations, Tutoring Tomorrow Today and Slick Refuge Committee, both of which he says are about bringing people together for something meaningful. Nestor grew up, like Gabriela, in Southern California and whose parents are also immigrants from Mexico. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause for all the panelists. All righty. I'm kind of going to get to this. Um, because right now, as we're sitting here, I read an article in the Boston Globe about 
uh, an undocumented woman who has taken sanctuary at a church just down the street, at your church. Um, and sh with her are two of her children, U.S. citizen children. I would like to point out that um, she, of course, is not comfortable at this time, given everything that's happening, being public about her name and other details surrounding that. But I have to tell you, at Define American, when we heard about this, the question we had is, how did this come together? Like, how, what was the process, right, of this woman um, from Ecuador, I believe? This woman, not only finding sanctuary at your church, but how did, how did you all get together to make this happen? If you speak with each one of us, I think the uh, pathway into this will be a little different because we're a coalition now of nine congregations and soon to be 10. Uh, so I can speak for the process at University Lutheran Church. In the season immediately following the election, for us in our tradition, it was Advent. That meant it was a time of repentance. And one of the things that uh, we became more wide awake to after the election was that the situation in the previous administration for undocumented individuals was bad. Now, scales are off our eyes. We're seeing how much worse it may be getting and asking ourselves, because we're a congregation committed to standing with the neighbor in love and justice to our fullest capacity, what might we have uh, in terms of resources to do that? And over weeks, we spent time with a lot of one-to-one -one -one conversations, thinking about our own sanctuary stories, our own experiences of displacement. We began to be in conversation with partners like Old Cambridge Baptist Church and several other churches in the Harvard Square area. There was this uh, swelling of uh, individuals and congregations who were coming to the same conclusion that we need to take steps. For University Lutheran, uh, that gradually led us to understand that as a congregation for 35 years, uh, sheltering people um, on a nightly basis in a Harvard College student homeless shelter in our basement, uh, we might be uniquely uh, positioned to uh, open up our second floor to someone seeking sanctuary. And so it was a, a period of assessment and prayer and education, getting connected with uh, people who were much closer to the communities of the undocumented than we certainly were. Uh, so, I mean, that's probably a good overview. Yeah. It took weeks by the end, two months, by the end of January, our congregation was able to um, vote in an annual meeting to become a sanctuary uh, housing congregation. But as part of that, we said, we will do this if four of their congregations step in with us. So I'm curious, so were you one of the first four congregations that jumped on board? We were. Uh, some of the clergy from these congregations have been talking over coffee for weeks about it, but when we started talking to our congregations about it, the excitement was just palpable uh, for getting together and seeing what was possible. Uh, Old Cambridge Baptist Church was a sanctuary church in 1984, uh, housing an El Salvadorian uh, labor union organizer uh, who had fled her country after um, suffering violence there for her organizing work. They took her into the sanctuary here in 84. She lived in our chapel, bathed in the baptistry, which is right behind the wall here. And we were fairly certain we didn't have the physical space to house someone comfortably in this building, uh, but we had the capacity to support this network that seemed to be growing. So uh, members of this congregation joined members of University Lutheran and First Church Cambridge and some other congregations around the square uh, and, and got things started. And other congregations have just joined uh, with the same level of excitement the weeks following. I don't want to understand, so when did the meetings like start happening? You said so in January, late January, the congregation voted. And then when did the other congregations get involved? This was um, a movement that was building in several different places, not in isolation, because 
as Cody mentioned, uh, the leaders of these congregations had already been speaking with one another. Really critical, though, mm -hmm. to the development of this particular coalition was the leadership that we had from students of Harvard Divinity School. And uh, without those students in each of our congregations and SLIC, which um, Gabby and Nestor will talk some more about, I'm sure. Uh, they brought into this some organizing experience mm. that uh, turned out to be exactly what we needed in order to begin to um, embrace an identity of being in this together as a coalition rather than as separate congregations. That's why I would really love to bring both Gabriella and Nestor, who are both proudly from Southern California. I'm from California as well, so. Uh, yeah, talk to me about that. Like, how did you, how did you get involved with this? Definitely, well, I think Gabby, myself, and a lot of other students in SLIC, we just had a lot of relationships with friends at school who were undocumented and didn't have DACA with the workers. DACA, which is the Deferred Action Program that 800,000 young people youngish people <laughs> were given uh, work permits and reprieve from deportation under the Obama administration. Exactly. So one of our friends at Divinity School actually is not eligible because he came one month too late to be eligible. Also, there are DACA students at the Divinity School. Well, I'm not sure if there are. There might be incoming, but the ones, there was some that weren't eligible. Yeah. Yeah, and also a lot of workers at Harvard are immigrants. Any dining hall, mm -hmm. any of the buildings you clean. So we had a lot of relationships. We worked, we're like going back well before the election. I mean, this isn't an issue that's new to any like of us, if that's their lived experience. Yeah. But one of the principles of Slick from early on was not to save anyone, just to walk the journey together. And I'm sure Gabby can speak a lot more to that. But we thought about what happens if something happens to our friend at Div School? What happens to the worker's kid we know that just came from El Salvador last summer? What happens? And that's when we first started thinking about things. And then we connected with another student at Divinity School, Chris, who's at University of Lutheran. A lot of students at Divinity School are also part of Old Cambridge Baptist and all the other um, congregations. So that's when we first started getting together. And one of the first things directly related to this is Gabby got a lot of student groups together to write a letter um, to the different congregations saying that if they wanted to do sanctuary, that there's a lot of students behind what they're doing. And I think mainly though, I think what we're doing is again, walking that journey with people. I would love to hear, <laughs> you know, what it means to be in solidarity, what it means to be an ally is such a big question. Um, at Defined American, we're finding that there are more people now that want to get involved. But what is the posture? Like, what does it mean to be an ally? What does it mean to not condescend and not, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So can you talk to me a little bit about being in journey with people? What does that mean? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think something that both me and Nestor and a lot, also people in the Cambridge Interface Sanctuary Coalition, I think, always remind ourselves and find us to be really important when we're walking with somebody that we, as people who are US citizens, are not stopping somebody's deportation for them. That person is taking that action on their own and we are supporting them but we're not the leaders of this. The person that we're working with is. And I think that's really important to remember, especially for me as a daughter of immigrants. My family came from Bolivia and El Salvador. My mom escaped the Civil War. Um, but I'm not undocumented. I don't know what it's like to be undocumented. I've lived my whole life as a US citizen. And so it's not my place to speak for that community when I'm standing with people. So it's really important to remember for me and for I think a lot of people to constantly be reminding ourselves that even though, for example, we are taking action as civil disobedience, providing sanctuary for people, at the end of the day, the person in sanctuary is the one standing up to the unjust immigration laws. It's not, we're not taking the big risk. Her life is on the line more than ours and we always need to remind ourselves that she is in charge of all of this and she's taking the biggest risk and doing the most work. And I think that's the most important thing to constantly remind yourself because if not, 
you end up speaking for people or stepping up to a place that you don't really belong in if you're not undocumented. Let me actually ask both of you. I'm curious, how do you explain what you're doing to your parents? How do you tell them? Like, you know, right now, like, I'm curious, like, how do you explain what you're doing here? That's a good question. Actually, during our graduation week is when we were having a lot of these conversations with a mom who's in sanctuary now. Yeah. Also, during graduation week, Gabby and I actually got to introduce someone to our parents who we helped him get out of detention. He was a teenager. From, he's a teenager from East Boston. And I think I'm blessed, lucky, to have parents that are understandable, but I think it's pretty simple. I think them being in this country, deciding to stay in this country, live their life in their communities, shows that immigration laws are unjust because despite that, they're gonna live and try to stay with their communities. And I think I just explained to them I'm supporting people like this teenager from East Boston who was in detention, he's from El Salvador, or this mom from Ecuador that's in Sanctuary at University Lutheran with the Cambridge Interface Sanctuary Coalition. And I just say, it's cool to see different communities practicing their faith, or a bunch of students, or workers, or people that work at Harvard practice their ethical convictions to stand with people against unjust laws. That's how I explain it. Um, well, we were in the same boat where we were working on this during graduation. Actually, during graduation, I was, had, I was holding my diploma, and I was like hiding in a classroom on a phone call with lawyers because we were trying to make appointments for her to be able to go check with some of the lawyers she's working with now. So I felt really bad because I kept ditching my mom, but afterwards, <laughs> I kept like ditching her in Harvard Square. <laughs> felt so bad. But afterwards, when I was able to explain when it was no longer a secret, she actually said, I'm sorry I took you away from that work. Because my mom, like I mentioned before, came during the Salvadoran Civil War and was undocumented until most of my family actually became documented through IRCA. Um, which 1986? Is, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which allowed for amnesty for a lot of people, but also made immigrating to the United States a lot harder for a lot of people. So I think, and so it makes no sense, but like I think something that my family understands is the arbitrariness that allowed for them to become U.S. citizens now, because they came in this correct window of time to be able to receive amnesty. But then doesn't, but they understand that that doesn't make their receiving that, like just because other people came at different time doesn't make them less deserving or less able to, to receive these benefits that my family did, but they just got lucky. And so I think my family has always had that understanding that they are very privileged and we're lucky to come between this window of time and they understand that there's other people in our community who didn't have that ability, and didn't have that privilege. And so just because they missed that window that they didn't receive amnesty or because they're coming now, there's, it's harder to get into the country and there's stricter laws. And so I think I'm very lucky to come from a family that is understanding of those facts and is very supportive of all the work that we've all been doing. Walk me through, and this is where I think, you know, one of our goals is to distribute what we're doing right now and really any congregation across this country um, that wanna do this work is curious about the actual process, right? So when did you first hear of this, I think all we can say is she's a 26 year old woman from, El Sal from, El Sal from Ecuador with two US citizen kids. When did you first hear about her? And who first heard about her? That's a good question. I think that's why it's so important to be connected with different communities whether it's workers at Harvard, a lot of which are immigrants, like that's a lot of slicks work, but also with statewide organizations like MCAN, Massachusetts Community Actions Network. So someone from MCAN gave us a call. And I think- when, a, Around what time? Around when was this? Grad, sometime in graduation. graduation. Yeah, like, yeah. Before graduation, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, three weeks ago. Okay, got it. So we spent a lot of time discern, discerning a lot of discernment process and first um so you got the call janine called them and then uh, like so janine is a, from the statewide organization then someone from the state organization asked us if we can have a one-on-one -on -one call just share who we are what we're doing that the person felt comfortable then 
We were there to listen. Yes. And a person told us everything over the phone. So the next day, uh, we, Gabby, me, Pastor Kathleen, and Chris, another divinity student who's at Uniloo, we all met and we just sat and talked. Then another thing that we did. Like, and what was the first question that you were asking yourselves? Well, like, how do we help out? Or do we, do we, do we talk to, Rever like, what is that conversation like? The first question is, what does this mother need? Mm. And how might what we've organized to provide um, work for her? It's, as Gabby keeps reminding us, it's her story. And it's kind of astonishing that you have a conversation with an individual on the phone for an hour, or you sit with her in the room of a friend for a couple hours, imagining that here's an individual who, again, their life is on the line. And based on listening to you know, who we are, I think there's, I can only imagine there's a need to establish a sense that these people are trustworthy. So I guess from our standpoint, um, at least mine, uh, I'm sure anybody here, uh, we, we want to be clear about what we can offer and we want to be um, entirely transparent and helpful. We want to be trustworthy. So that was the, kind of the next step. When did you come into the picture? Well, I joined the conversation later that afternoon. Uh, I went down to the church and got caught up on, on this particular person's story. But, I mean, the network had been meeting. Yeah, since uh, Jan for example, right, since January. Right, since January. So there yeah. was a process uh, in place. Uh, There's sort of a knowledge about what we could provide and whether or not that would be a good fit for the person who came forward to, uh, to enter sanctuary. So all of that was already thought through really clearly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what, how you feel about this, but from my perspective as a pastor in this network, uh, I'm not leading this work. I mean, I'm supporting it, I'm facilitating it, I'm enabling, I'm filling in gaps where, where I need to. But once the congregations of these uh, churches got involved and the Harvard uh, student leadership got involved, uh, there is a network of about 150 or so volunteers who have been doing this work. Um, so it wasn't like the four of us got together and decided if this was right or not. Uh, there was a process that, that was happening before we had that conversation that afternoon and that continued afterwards with so many people in these congregations that are involved. When did the lawyers get involved, or were they involved from the very beginning? I think Gary can speak more to this, but I think the lawyer question is really important. Incredibly important. Because a lot of people from those communities don't have access to lawyers. Yes. It's, it's civil law. So I think Gabby had a lot of good relationships with lawyers. That's why one of the letters in our group, L, stands for legal, to have those legal connections, like the L in slick. Mm -hmm. So Gabby can speak to that. But I think really importantly, we thought about what would be clear ways to get this person out of sanctuary. What kind of relief might be possible? What might be the different approaches we might take? Again, to be transparent, to be what is best for this mom, but I think Gabby can speak more on the lawyer part. Um, yeah, so we met with her the first time on a Wednesday, and then we set up an appointment with some lawyers that we were really lucky to have contact with the next Friday, I believe. And we were like working really, like they were really amazing immigration lawyers because some, it's, we just lucked out that they're really caring and wonderful and we were there for hours and they were go, like oh, going and grabbing more law books and like trying to figure out if there was a possibility of relief because we, like Nestor said, we didn't want to have someone come stay with us and then just be like, okay, like you can just sit here and like wait because she doesn't want to be like locked up in a church. That's not ideal for anybody. Like she was obviously taking that step and she really wanted to do that because it was the safest place for her. But she has two young kids. We don't want her to like be stuck there forever. And so we were really lucky to get connected with these amazing lawyers who took her case on pro bono and meet with her about for a few hours every week just to go over her story and to work on the possibility of reopening her asylum case. So that's where she's at currently with her um, possibility for relief. And let me just say, by the way, because you made up a really interesting point. You know, immigration is not one size fit all. 
<laughs> like I get questioned daily about why don't I just fix this problem, yeah. right? Like, I mean, we have to really, this is where the, the, our lives are really dependent on lawyers, immigration lawyers, trying to figure out what kind of solution is possible. So after that meeting, how, what was the decision, you know, there's a, there's a, I thought a very helpful Boston Globe article. When was the decision to contact the press made and say, let's, let's let people know that this is happening? Who made that decision? That's a good question. I think it's a group decision, but I think as everyone has been saying, at the end of the day, it's the mom and sanctuary's yes. choice what parts of her story to share and how it's told to who. So I think one of the things that was really important from the start is this is a person who didn't want her name out there or her face because she was scared that if she's deported, she might get killed in the country she's sent to because there's people out there and to kill her and her family. So I think for her, it was not negotiable for her to have her face shown everywhere or her name, at least not now. Maybe if there's relief, maybe if there's certainty that she won't get deported, she wants to share everything about her story when the time is right. But for now, I think that was a lot of the discernment in this whole process is, um, yeah, Pastor Kathleen. Just as Gabby had these amazing uh, cultivated over time relationships with Lawyers. lawyers. Mm -hmm. And just as we had over time developed a strong relationship with Slick and with MCAN, uh, as we entered into this, we began to draw attention. This is before, when we formed the coalition, before there was a guest on the horizon, we began to interact with the media in the Boston area. And that's another area of cultivating relationships. Because when it's um, time for a story to be told, having someone who can listen well <laughs> as a journalist to that is key. And that's what happened over the first weekend. Such a journalist was um, already in relationship with this coalition story. And so the Boston Globe was the best um, media outlet to have this conversation with. And um, I think it was done incredibly well and with great respect. And sensitively, yeah. And actually, because you were interviewed in the, in the church with her. How was that process like, by the way, translating? I'm assuming, by the way, was, was, did the, were you translating for, for the woman in sanctuary to the reporter? How was that process like? <laughs> well, I want to speak. Uh, I think there's a couple of things. I, Gabby's an expert translator. Um, she translates for a lot of like lawyers and legal stuff, so she already had that experience. Um, but I think just important is someone to, for the mom and sanctuary to just be comfortable with, also us knowing when to tell re the reporter. We should move on to the next question because this is a little too sensitive right now. As a reporter, that's a really, really good. That's <laughs> a, you have to tell reporters, uh, we're not going to answer that question. <laughs> cool. I think Gabby can speak more about this. translating. Yeah, no, I think it was, um, it was difficult. Translating in immigration cases is always really difficult um, because you're always touching on very sensitive topics. And so like both of you mentioned, it's was important to be ha able to have that both of us there because I think there was like the emotional support while because while you're translating you can't really stop to be like oh, okay like I need to like make sure that someone's doing okay because it's you're like moving both languages in your head so I think it was good to have the both of us there to be able to make sure that at least one of us was making and sure we we're checking in on her because there were moments where she was like had to stop and take a break and leave the room and we had to go grab tissues because she has a really tough story. Um, it was tough and her kids were there. And, and the so, kids are how old? Eight um, months? And two and a half and eight months. So they're months. little, they're little girls. They're very adorable. Um, but yeah, I think it was, uh, it was, it's tough. Translating is always very tough because you're telling these really intimate details of someone's lives to someone else and hoping that you do it right. But I think it was important 
for both of us to be there and to provide that support since we had already established a relationship with her and she trusted us to communicate correctly what she wanted communicated to basically the outside world. I wanted to ask both of you specifically this question of what, what did it feel like reading that story, which is right now kind of the definitive story on her and the circumstances. What did it feel like having your photographs, both of you, in the story? I think for me, it made me remember no matter what I'm doing or anything, I'm not the one that's at risk of getting deported. So that's a great level of privilege. I think that's one of the things that I thought about. Yeah, I think I fell in the same boat where at first I saw it and I knew like we had talked about it with the reporter because like we obviously weren't gonna show the family's face because they made it explicitly clear that they did not want her or her children's faces in the paper. And I think they asked if it was okay to take our picture and I was like, oh, it's fine. Like, cause I didn't really think that much about it. But then when I saw it, I was like, oh man, people are gonna like recognize me. Someone might come up and yell at me or something. Cause you never know. But at the end of the day, like Nestor's right. Like I think that's something important to always remind yourself, like whether it's your picture in the paper, whether you're doing work of like helping other people like in this way, that no matter what risk you face, it isn't the same as the person who's in danger of being deported. Like I'm not, I've been a US citizen my whole life. I never have to fear getting sent back to El Salvador or Bolivia because I'm being separated from my family because of like making a public statement or anything like that. I wanna point out, however, at a time like this when, at Define American, for example, we, we host one of the largest story banks of stories of undocumented people. We've had experiences of people reaching out to us and saying, I don't feel comfortable being public anymore. Can you take my story down? And of course, we have to respect that. So now that there are many undocumented people even emailing me directly who feel less willing to be out, if we can't be out, other people have to be out. And that's you, right? I mean, that's the risk that you have to take, right? It is a risk, I have to say, yes. One of the things that, that really struck me when you were saying that was the um, willingness of the woman who was in sanctuary here in the 80s uh, uh, and still lives in this community, eventually became a citizen with her three children. She's a preschool teacher here in Cambridge. Uh, when we started this coalition again, or when we started this coalition at this iteration of Sanctuary, she came forward and said, if you need me to tell my story, I'll be there. And so she came and met with a reporter from NPR about a month ago, and uh, her story uh, ran on NPR, both locally and nationally, uh, where she talked about the circumstances that brought her to the US from El Salvador uh, to seek sanctuary, and her process of um, going through the process of becoming a citizen. So I was really impressed and thankful for her willingness to come back 30 years later almost to say, if you need my story from those days, mm. I'll be there to, to do And she continues to be willing to do that if we need her. Reverend Reed, I wanted to ask you specifically, how, how, do congrega like, how does your congregation feel um, at the University of Lutheran having this? I mean, Cambridge is now one of the epicenters of this conversation. How does that... What, what kind of feedback are you getting? The feedback that I get without exception, and this, this makes this congregation and maybe a few others in the network unusual in a national perspective. Um, but there is um, a deeply shared sense of call that we are where we're supposed to be. And we're doing everything we possibly can. We had been preparing for the day when, or the night when we would get a call that someone was ready to come in to our building to live in sanctuary. And the day it happened, the network was activated and there was palpable that's a good word, a palpable sense of, we are ready for this. Reverend Sanders, I'm curious here at Harvard, because we are at Harvard, <laughs> let's remember this. I'm, I'm curious, like, what is the reaction from the community here at the university, the students, the student body? I think Gabby and Nestor probably have a better sense of that than I do. Uh, but, but I'm curious from, like, the faculty, I mean, clearly the student body here is represented, but the faculty and the administrators of the university, has the university president said anything about this so far? 
Not about our coalition that I know of, no. Uh, so most of the pastors of these congregations that uh, are part of the coalition serve as the chaplains for that denominational group at Harvard. So through these pastors, there is a relationship to the university. Um, but I, I mean, aside from just informal conversations I've had with folks, there, I don't think there's been any official statement about our work. One of these informal conversations um, related to the fact that as a university, Harvard has been approached uh, and pressed to become a sanctuary campus and has declined to do that. That's precisely why I asked the question, but please go ahead. And so once this coalition um, began to be formed and the word spread, uh, there was a great deal of gratitude that came our our way in terms of you're going to make it possible for those at Harvard, faculty, staff, and students who want to step out um, to have a community to do that with. You know, the word that kept coming up, I counted nine times so far in this conversation, is the word relationship. And so if I'm a congregation in Alabama or in Texas, everybody please pray for Texas. Um, wherever I may be in this country, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, what are the first steps do I need to take, right, to say that my congregation can serve a sanctuary? Anyone in the panel? Well, I think, number one, not saving anyone. Not saving anyone. And learning from, I'm learning a lot from the mom in sanctuary. I'm learning a lot from everyone here. I'm learning a lot from my friend at Harvard who doesn't have DACA. I'm learning a lot from the workers a kid who came from El Salvador. I think the first step is, I like Father Greg Boyle. He started at Homeboy Industries. Yes. And I like how he says it's not about being for someone, but with someone. I think that approach to the relationship, I think, is a good first step. For, for me, it makes sense to think about your history as a congregation. Uh, of course, uh, Providing sanctuary, offering sanctuary is a risky endeavor. It feels risky to people. It's not something that people uh, take lightly or without some trepidation. But um, so for me, I'm a gay Baptist minister from the South. And a lot of the, one of the things I do a lot is talk to churches who are trying to become affirming of LGBT people. And when, when I, my approach in that is to help churches sort of mine their congregation's narrative for the reasons why becoming an affirming congregation to LGBT people makes sense at this point in history and how it builds on their history of justice work and standing with the marginalized and working for justice with the oppressed, et cetera. And I think a very similar approach is helpful for churches considering sanctuary. Uh, I don't think any church that's never, uh, has never sort of set foot in any kind of social justice arena is going to suddenly become a sanctuary. But there's so many churches that have a long history of work around economic justice, LGBTQ justice, gender justice, and building on those narratives and understanding why becoming sanctuary makes sense because of the arc of your congregation's narrative, that it has led you to this conversation at this point in time, and the spirit is moving in such a way that this conversation needs to happen now. That's the kind of way that I think churches need to be engaged in the sanctuary conversation. Reverend Reed, I can, I can feel you wanting to say something, please. No, I, just to... I just wanted to say amen. <laughs> uh, because that's how it's worked for us. And I think I said at the beginning, we're a congregation that for decades has housed the marginalized. Uh, and we do it with everything we can. So it, it gets to a point for us, why would we not? Cody pointed out that there are congregations who a pastor may sense a call to this and the congregation's narrative hasn't prepared for this step, that pastor has a lot of, a lot of incredibly hard work. And what it may, um, may involve partnering with congregations in the neighborhood or in the same town who have taken the step, because sometimes a congregation that's been on the fringe or not involved in social justice begins to see their neighbors mm. doing it. They begin to hear conversations at the grocery store. They 
begin to hear people at the Rotary meetings talking about this. And, and, and that's, that's encouragement. It emboldens. I have one last question before we open it to the audience. Uh, Define America and Ryan Eller, who's our executive director, and I had the privilege of meeting Jeanette Visguera in Denver in March. We met her at a basement of the church and where her grandson Santiago was actually playing <laughs> in the background. Um, but I remember one of the things she said was, you know, this idea of a moral responsibility that places of worship have at a time like this. We know um, that the Trump administration has been shameless in the way they're executing their vision of what America is supposed to look like, arresting people outside of courthouses, arresting people in front of their children, arresting people in the middle of a street, while in a car, all of that. One place that they have not gone into is the church. And the last question I want to ask this panel, and this is something that I've been thinking a lot about, and I've been thinking a lot about it as a, as a Filipino who was raised a Catholic but was, um, <laughs> was punished by my grandfather when I came out as gay because it didn't fit the Catholic churches in his vision of it. So my relation to the church has always been a little bit painful. And when I think of this moment, I think of this question of what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of God when national citizenship isn't available? What does that mean for you, each one of you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to ask. Um, I think that the current uh, political climate in the United States is an easier climate uh, for churches to see what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God uh, versus the empire of America or any other empire. It has not changed, though, significantly what it means for churches to be the kingdom of God uh, in, in this context. I mean, there were many deportations under Obama. Yes. Uh, we weren't as aware of them. They weren't as politicized. The, the rhetoric wasn't as violent. Uh, so now we have this sort of stark relief where we can begin to see the, what it really means to be uh, standing for a different way. But Christianity has always been on the margins in an anti-imperial movement. Eventually, it sort of got co-opted by the empire, and it continues to be co-opted by the empire again and again in the US as well as in Rome, uh, ancient Rome. Um, but it has always been, in its truest forms, and in its most spirited forms, uh, a movement that stands against the uh, oppressive status quo. Reverend Reed. There was a theologian in Germany in the 1920s, early 30s, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who uh, said loosely the following. Uh, the church is called initially to work with the civil authorities to ensure justice and fair treatment for all. Secondly, when that isn't happening, then it's the church's call to step out and challenge. Uh, and then finally, when the civil authority is completely intransigent, then the church is not called simply to bandage the victims, but rather to throw a spoke in the wheel of injustice. That sums it up, as far as I'm concerned. Gabby? So I'm Muslim, and I come from a tradition. Actually, well, I went to divinity school, but I haven't really, till recently, thought about what role my faith, what role it plays in the work I'm doing right now. But I think, I had to think about it recently, because someone asked me this question. And there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, that he says that you, as a Muslim, it's your job to stand for justice, even if you have to bear witness against your neighbors, even if you have to bear witness against your family, even if you have to bear witness against your own self. And so I feel like for me, my faith tradition is constantly asking if I'm standing for justice, and if I'm not, I'm committing a sin. I'm not doing what God wants me to do. I'm not standing for justice, and I'm not standing for my fellow human being. So I think for me, that is something that has always motivated me to stand with other people and to be a, 
and to work with other people and in particular with this work I mean I, I'm a product of immigration I, my parents didn't make the decision to come to this country because I'm a mix <laughs> Bolivia and El Salvador are not close to each other I would not exist and so I think I'm indebted to that but also my faith tradition pushes me to always check myself to make sure I'm standing for justice I, I'm sorry no, it's okay. I think there's an opportunity right now. And one of the things that I love about the Cambridge Interface Sanctuary Coalition and everyone is that no one is doing it because someone is good labor or highly skilled <laughs> or a Harvard student. And even with that undocumented student at Harvard that I told you about, that doesn't have DACA, we always have this conversation about how do we make sure that we're being inclusive in every front? How do we make sure, and you know, Unilu, Old Cambridge are inclusive in a lot of other communities, but I think the opportunity now is, especially when people of faith from their own traditions are saying, we're not opening our doors or we're not standing with people because they're a good immigrant, but simply because of their person, they're a person, or as my undocumented student friend says in his words by virtue of their existence they're good enough and I think we have the opportunity to do that we would love to take questions from the audience we have a mic that Reverend Ryan Eller who's playing Oprah will pass around and please introduce yourself by the way okay my name is Maureen Power and I'm a member of Old Cambridge Baptist Church and I was privileged in the 80s to be part of our sanctuary uh, team. And uh, I realized then in the risks that we took, and our kids were very young then too, um, how enlivening it was and continue to be to stand with the woman Estella and her family and to do what we did. I noticed what happened in our church community and how much more enlivened we all were by this experience. And I would like to speak again to that, that growth and that excitement and connection and, and the joy and the faith that, that arises as I sit in the coalition meetings. Mm. And... Um, and I have gotten to connect with so many other sisters and brothers that I never knew before. And um, we're a very mixed age group. I'm at the one end, and there are a lot of uh, younger and people and people in the middle. But I think of the, particularly the young women from the Cambridge Minion uh, who are part of this. They're not exactly a congregation, so I felt I just wanted to mention that group, how terrific it's been to work with them and to become connected and friends. And uh, something very special is happening. And I just want to notice and witness to the fact that we are all being helped by this. Mm. We are all growing by this. And this is making us uh, better people. I want to add to that one note about OCBC story because I think this is really connected to the way a congregation's narrative unfolds. Uh, and practicing sanctuary had such a profound impact in the life of this congregation that in their, through the early 80s they were practice, talking about it and practicing sanctuary. And the congregation at OCBC realized they were, this was at the height of the AIDS crisis that there were LGBT people in the U.S. who also needed a different form of sanctuary. When churches were not open to them, when the government was literally allowing uh, gay men to die of AIDS in droves and doing nothing about it. OCBC became a welcoming and affirming a congregation to LGBT people in 1983. Mm -hmm. And from 1983 to this present day, as I stood behind the pulpit today, uh, has been led by gay and lesbian pastors. Wow. So making this decision to become sanctuary is going to have a profound impact on the life of any congregation that does it, far beyond just the practice of sanctuary. It will change the congregation uh, in the direction the spirit is blowing.
Hi, I, I'm a student here at Harvard. I, I'm in the Econ PhD program. So I really applaud you for providing shelter and um, sanctuary to this woman. And you mentioned something about being on the side of justice. I think there's a very big problem with like the idea that, you know, in the end, this is a country based on laws. So if you think it's unjust to deport a woman, uh, you are against the law. So do you have any proposal of what a more realistic and sensible um, immigration system would be? Uh, or are you just saying that you see your role as just you know, helping some um, separated cases of people that would really need your help? Or do you have like a larger idea of what a proper immigration system would be? All of us can answer that question, but let me just start with something really briefly, which is, I think, and this is something that I had to really sit with in the past few years, which is we live in a country, and our own history tells us that the laws that this country has cre have created and enacted have not always meant just, and that, and that justice doesn't mean what we consider to be legal or the construct of legality hasn't always meant just for people. And I say that as we celebrate LGBT Pride Weekend in Boston this weekend, right? So I think there's that. The other thing before I'd like anybody else to answer that question is, you know, I used to think, I used to subscribe to the notion that we have a broken immigration system. When you say that, it's broken. It's kind of like I broke my ankle a couple years ago and it broke. This feels deliberate. It feels that we have a deliberate system in this country of a legal, political, and economic system that further marginalizes people with no power, which gets me to the original point, which is that the law is constructed by people in power, not by this woman with two children, US citizen children, right, who is have, have to hide in a church so she can exist. So any other points you want to make? Well, I think I really appreciate what you said because I think one of the starting points that we come at this work at is placing ourselves in the context of sanctuary in the 80s, of other unjust systems like segregation or slavery, and we remind ourselves that just because something was legal didn't make it right, and that a lot of people of faith and others took a lot of risks mm -hmm. to make sure those systems were undone because they were unjust. I have to say though, I'm so appreciative that you asked that question. Like, have you had somebody in the congregation say, wait, this, is, this person is not here legally, how do we justify this legally? Is that a part of the questions that you get from any members of the congregation? I have to say we haven't. You have not. And, but, there's, but there's a reason for that. At the same time, there's an awareness that um, the laws need to be um, challenged. Part of our coalition, it has three emphases. One is to provide physical sanctuary. One is to be in direct conversation with those who are in a position to change the laws. So I can't answer the question personally about what would be fair immigration laws because that is just not my wheelhouse. However, we are connected with people at the local, state, and federal level to work for uh, changes in laws. It's, it's part of who we are. Reverend Sanders? Yeah, I mean, I agree. This is uh, sort of a multi-pronged approach, and the coalition itself has the uh, goal of also advocating for more just uh, immigration laws locally, nationally. And one of the things we've been really working hard on in the last months, uh, there was a huge turnout at the State House on Friday, is the Safe Communities Act here in Massachusetts, which would, you know, uh, not allow a Muslim registry to exist in the state, would not allow state um, resources like the state police to act as immigration officials and things of that nature. So that's been a local uh, act that we have been mobilizing on pretty strongly in the last few months. Uh, as one example of that. Yes. Hi, I'm Sarah. I live in Cambridge. I have a little bit of a complicated question. Um, members of my family are uh, extreme right-wing Christians, evangelicals, and you know, I've had exchanges with 
uh, friends and family. Um, and is, is there some kind of activities sort of have exchanges to, because I feel like they also feel like they're on the side of justice and morality and what Christ would have wanted. And um, is, is there movements within the religious community to kind of bridge that divide or? I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure I got your name. What was your first I'm Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking that question. Because <clears throat> uh, I really feel that churches um, and places of worship are those communal places where we must insist on having these complicated, uncomfortable conversations. So I would, I would love to hear if, if there is such a place. If, and, and if there isn't a place, how do we make that happen? What, what, what could that look like? Well, in my tradition today was the festival of the Holy Trinity. If we can make space for discussing what the Holy Trinity is, we can make space for anything. Uh, <laughs> Somebody tweet that right now. So. Um, our denomination and our faith network is not alone in having resources and people who can come in and bring firsthand knowledge. And I think uh, one of the big gaps in all of this is a lack of firsthand knowledge. And so a church is a space of hospitality, a church is a space for holy listening, um, invoking that identity as a faith community can create daylight for conversations. Uh, two things I would say, well, one thing really is, is that the way stories are told. I mean, I think it's important to hear stories of people uh, like this woman whose story is not public yet, but uh, uh, or Magda who is in sanctuary here, um, stories humanize this in a way that the rhetoric that swirls in our social consciousness uh, doesn't. But it also matters how you tell the story of your faith tradition. I mean, there's a way of telling the story of Jesus such that you could imagine that Jesus would be on the side of, you know, our current unjust laws or whatever. But it's really hard to, to tell the story of an undocumented or of a you know, a poor Palestinian Jew in occupied territory who moved unauthorized across borders in order to escape violence from the empire, and then eventually was executed by the empire. I mean, to really tell that story in a way that would make you think Jesus would not be on the side of the marginalized and the oppressed and the people who are put at risk by the laws of the empire. Uh, so, I mean, be engaged in your religious tradition. This is, I think, one of the things that harms religious traditions is that those who are most critical and most uh, astute at telling these stories in this way distance themselves from their religious tradition or their religious family because the religion is used in a way to harm. But if you distance yourself, then you give up control, not control, you give up influence in how the story is told. So be engaged in your religious tradition in a way that you are telling the story. I would love to meet your family members. <laughs> we'll figure out a way to do that. <laughs> One last question, apparently, before we run out of time. I would just like to add to Sarah's question. My name is Nancy Moorhead. I'm from OCBC and was here in the 80s and now am part of the coalition and very grateful, very grateful to, for the leadership of folks like Chris Rood here and Gabby and Nestor. Um, I think Sarah's question is really at the heart of the matter here because, let's face it, we live in a bubble here in Cambridge and in the Boston area. We're very blessed. We, we have people all around us who think as we do and who see this issue the way we do. And that makes it easier to be courageous. But for folks um, who elected Donald Trump, and who may be part of Sarah's family circle, I think there's a lot of fear. I think that a lot of what's happening in the laws and in the political process are fear-based. I have no answers how to address that, but I think we first need to listen and hear that and know what is the way to deal with people who don't think as we do, who are frightened and look for law-based Mm -hmm. and strong man tactics. Let's face it, that's what it is. I'm so happy you brought that up because I think to, 
to add context to that, this is why precisely our organization is founded on stories. Um, and I'm so glad that you said this, Reverend Reed, but this is the most controversial yet least understood issue in America. People have no idea what this is. And I think in absence of knowledge, people grab onto the easy, simplistic boxes that we have painted. And stories have a way of making things more complicated, of not making it about legal or legal, but about what the gray area is and where most people are is in the gray area, right? So that's why I think stories are really important. But to your point, ma'am, I think listening is a radical act, right? Um, and so when, when I particularly, you know, when I get a lot of hate mail and people saying what they say, and you can't possibly hate someone you don't know. And so for me, I, I think of it as coming from a place of they don't even know me at all. We don't know this woman at all, and we would love to get to know her better. Um, but I think that in itself is the bridge that we have to create. 